Hi there, I'm John from Adventure Shetland and I'd like to thank you for joining me today in the first of our Spooky Shetland series. Um, this is where we're going to delve into Shetland's history, traditions, folklore over the course of the next month in the, the build-up to the Halloween period. So today we'll kind of be setting the scene for the rest of the month and we're going to begin with probably the most well-known of the creatures from Shetland's folklore, the Trous. But what is a trow? What do they do? And what is it about them that's endured through into the present day? Let's take each of these questions in turn and find out. A trow is the name given to a member of uh, the race of Shetland's hill folk, and they're fairly analogous with the Norwegian trolls, although with a uh, few key local differences. They're often referred to as the grey folk due to their attire and appearance. They're kind of a bit melancholy and sad a lot of the time. Um, they're also referred to as the peery folk because they're quite small in stature. We'll come on to that again shortly. Uh, they're also quite often referred to in literature sources as the good folk, um, out of fear of causing them offence uh, because that would certainly bring reprisals with it. Um, but again, we'll discuss that a bit later on. So the trous are small in stature, although there's no real agreement on exactly how small that could be. Um, but generally it's thought that they're no more than sort of around three feet tall. Generally they'd be dressed in grey or sometimes shades of green and brown, depending on, on the stories and the tales that you listen to, hence the name of the grey folk that we've, we've spoken about before. And as I said, that also could be to do with their kind of melancholy, sort of moody air that they carry about with them. Um, in terms of physical features, they're generally pretty humanoid, um, although they're usually described as being extremely ugly, um, with kind of long pointed nose, pointed ears, small, dark, sometimes red, beady eyes, um, usually long, dark hair, claws on their fingers and toes, using the shadows there. Um, things like that, like, yeah, quite ugly, but humanish, but, but not. As I've said, the trous are the hill folk, and that's generally where they would be found to be living, um, sort of up beyond um, the boundaries of, of the crofts and, and the tunes and the villages um, that go with them. So up in the kind of desolate and remote valleys, hills, um, usually living in little mows or mounds, knolls, um, lumps and bumps in the landscape, um, usually where it's quite boggy, quite peaty, and, and certainly not on the fertile land that people would be, would be using. Additionally, I've seen mention online, particularly of um, a race of sea trows, although looking back through um, the rest of the folklore sources that I have, it doesn't seem to be any, uh, any kind of mentions of those whatsoever. It does just seem to be an online thing. However, uh, Shetland does have uh, a whole cast and variety of different sea creatures and sea monsters uh, that we'll come on to talk about in, in later videos in this series, so stay tuned for those. So to come back to our hill trous, it's quite interesting that a lot of place names contain, containing the element petter, which is the Old Norse word for Picts, also have strong associations with, with trous. Um, an example of this would be Petadale in the middle of the Lang um, which is an area that's said to be absolutely rife with the hill folk. Um, perhaps it could be some kind of cultural hangover. So once the, um, the Vikings, the Norse people kind of arrived here, um, don't think that they actually killed off most of the local population, but certainly displaced them off of the good fertile land. Um, it's thought um, certainly traditionally anyway, that the Picts were a lot smaller, the Vikings were, were a, a taller race of people who, who came here. And um, so yeah, these, these kind of uh, previous people who were, who were smaller than the new inhabitants who were also said to be kind of fair-haired, tall, strong, the Picts were thought to be dark-haired, smaller, um, and so they're, they're pushed off, off the land and live in a kind of a, a, sub, a guerrilla subsistence kind of lifestyle, um, possibly staying in the remains of, of earlier civilizations as well. Um, 
be that kind of burial cairns, the remains of rocks, um, the various kind of mounds um, that these kind of archaeological remains would be. So um, it's possible that, uh, that this is kind of a, a folk memory um, and, and yeah, these, these kind of displaced Picts would, would kind of live in these, these kind of remote um, far-flung areas. Perhaps, um, as I said, kind of live in this, this guerrilla subsistence kind of lifestyle, they'd nip down or uh, kind of sneak down to, to the crofts, to the farmhouses, and pinch a pail, pail of milk from the cow or uh, a stook of oats or corn from the yard. Um, those sorts of things, kind of enough to live on or to supplement their kind of, um, their, their lifestyle, their livelihood, but not enough that it's going to kind of infuriate the, uh, the, the farmers and the settlers too much that there will, will kind of be a reprisal on them. Um, it's a theory anyway, um, it's maybe one that's worth kind of looking into a little bit more, but uh, I don't know, that might just be me. Anyway, we'll carry on. So yeah, the tribes could be sort of a, a cultural or a folk memory kind of hangover uh, of, of the Pictish people. Although interactions with, uh, with the tribes have continued right up until kind of relatively modern times, certainly long after kind of the, um, the Pictish culture died out. So uh, possibly not. So we've already started to touch on it. So it makes sense now to continue on to our Second question, what did the trows do? So, by and large, trow behaviour kind of seems to be dictated by how well or badly they've been treated by people, um, whether that's deliberately intended or otherwise. Um, if a trow has been, uh, per perceives that they've been treated badly by a person, then uh, they will respond in kind. They can be very malevolent, outright evil sometimes even. But generally, they'd be described as mischievous rather than having a full-on kind of ill intent. Um, yeah, they'd, they'd kind of be more likely to enjoy um, a prank on a person, removing something that they, they want to use at a particular time rather than causing them outright harm. And equally on the other side of the coin, um, they can also be quite generous to people, um, particularly if, uh, if a person has, has helped them or, or done them some other kindness. So the trous are largely regarded as thieves um, and they'll pinch anything from the aforementioned pail of milk, usually taken directly from the udders of the cow. Um, but they take everything right up to uh, people, whole people, um, usually they tend to favour uh, children or uh, brides or also um, mothers in or just after uh, labour and childbirth. And quite often they would replace that person with a, a stock or a changeling, um, quite often described as being made out of wood, um, certainly um, lacking the kind of the vigour and the vitality and sort of the essence of, of the original person. That the, uh, the trows have, have replaced, taken away with them and, and subsequently replaced. It's not just whole people that they take though, um, sometimes they just take a limb, um, if a person has gone lame or, or uh, something like that then uh, it could be said that the trows have taken the limb and replaced it again with, with a wooden stock. Um, it's a quite, quite a common uh, kind of feature in, in the folklore. Um, the trows also have a, a real greed for, for silver. Um, it's something that they, they can't resist, really. Um, interestingly though, they can basically uh, take whatever they want from humans, um, so long as they don't steal from other trows. That's, that's um, it's a big no-no in, uh, in trow society, surely. Um, there's a, a story from Unst uh, which tells us of uh, a young trow who's found wandering around near the Loch of Watley. Um, crying and moaning all the time um, because he stole some silver from another trout. He, he couldn't resist it and he got banished from, from returning back to uh, to his kind of trowy underground lair um, and, and was forced to kind of wander around aimlessly lost uh, and without a home. So there are a few ways to kind of um, 
protect yourself from the trous. Um, the trous are deathly feared of iron or steel. Um, so carrying a, a good knife or even a pair of scissors or something with you um, is, a, is a good defense against them. Um, it's also said that if you're surrounded by trous but you have your, your knife with you, um, you can trace a circle in the ground um, around you and the trous won't ever be able to cross that circle. Um, it'll act, they'll actually be repelled by it. Um, so you'll be safe un until until daylight comes. So you might have a long wait in, in your little circle that you've drawn, but uh, but yeah, the trous won't be able to harm you if you if you stay inside it. If you do ever encounter a trow, um, it is possible to prevent them from leaving you by by fixing your gaze on them and and, and keeping them um, within your within your gaze. Um, there's another story from Unst where. Um, a young boy managed to keep a, a whole family of trows captive, essentially, um, when they'd come in to, uh, to wash their baby um, and, and dry its clothes um, beside their fire. And he basically just kept his eyes fixed on them, um, didn't blink, and, uh, and, and they weren't able to leave. Um, eventually the trows got a bit anxious with this situation, the daylight was, was almost upon them. Um, and they got sort of really, really kind of agitated and, and fidgety. And the, the matriarch of this trow family had an idea and she took the, the tongs from beside the fire and stuck them in the flames until they became red hot. And then she, once they were, were heated up, she picked them up and walked towards the boy, brandishing them towards his face with a, an evil, evil grin on her um, and basically saying that she was going to burn his eyes out. Um, and uh, as the tongue, the tongs kind of approached the boy's face, he eventually blinked. And uh, at this point, the trous disappeared. Funnily enough, the trous are deathly afraid of all things Christian, whether that be Bibles, particularly open ones, um, the sign of the cross, even if it's made out of two lengths of straw um, crossing over each other, um, and particularly prayers, and the, even the mention of the name of God um, will cause them to flee instantly. Indeed, the surest way to protect people and property from the trows is by saining them. Um, essentially, that's, that's kind of blessing or, or consecrating them. Um, I suppose there's uh, kind of a, a number of ways to, to, to do that, to kind of perform that ritual. Um, but uh, yeah, failure to, to, to do so um, before kind of heading out or, or leaving people behind would surely have disastrous consequences. Of course, in absolutely no way are these stories just ways to get the general population to come around to the idea of uh, being good Christians. Often the trows required the services of particular uh, people or people with particular skills. Um, one of these groups of skilled people were midwives and uh, humans with, or human women particularly with, with skills in that area, were often um, taken by the trows to supervise trowy births. Um, generally speaking, they'd be treated well um, and kind of if, if all went smoothly, then they'd be returned to uh, to, to, to their normal human life um, without any problems. Um, but this goes for this yeah, goes for um, all persons um, kind of who've uh, been invited into um, the trow's uh, habitations. Um, if they accepted any of uh, the trowy food or drink or other hospitality, then uh, they were doomed to stay there. They couldn't leave, they couldn't return back to, to normal human life. Um, there's another story um, regarding a, a, a midwife, again uh, again from Unst. Um, seems to be a lot of trowy tales from up there. Um, and uh, in this instance, the, um, the midwife, the birth had gone well, and the midwife was um, kind of basically putting an, an ointment onto the, the trowy baby. Um, but in the, in the process of doing so, she got an itchy eye and she, she went and scratched her eye, as you do, um, but she still had a trace of the, the trow ointment on her finger. Um, trow ointments 
seem to be particularly powerful things and from that moment onwards she had impeccable sight in that eye um, so much so that she could identify um, ships and their crews miles out to sea she could identify individual men on board those boats um, really kind of remarkable vision but uh, one day uh, a time later she was out working with the other women collecting peats from the hill when they encountered a, a strange looking little man and uh, he, he came up and, and he asked her with which I she had this remarkable sight that was that was famed in the district and without thinking she told him and no sooner were the words out of her mouth he either uh, scratched her face or blew into her eye depending on which version of the story you know um, but from that moment forward um, she lost either the sight in her eye entirely or uh, just her vision returned kind of back to normal and she couldn't see in in this kind of super powered way um, that she had been able to for a while but yeah so it depends on on the, the version of the story that you've heard because um, there's a, a few versions of these things as, as happens with with tales in folklore so yeah I've mentioned the ointment there um, but uh, alongside that generally speaking items either given by the trows or left behind by them if they've um, kind of been uh, been been caught by a human or um, Kind of interrupted in, in some task by a human these items that they kind of drop and leave behind um, again are, are considered to be extremely lucky whether they have um, healing properties is quite a common one um, or just bring luck and, and prosperity to the people who find them um, is, is quite a, a common occurrence as well um, there's certainly some power in in trowy objects that's for sure now the other group of people who um, the trows kind of um, required from time to time or um, it's possible um, you could even go as far as to say that they revered these people are of course talented fiddlers yeah trows love nothing more than a good uh, tune a dance a spree a party um, and they would often borrow the services of, of human fiddlers to come and play at their, their various celebrations, whether that was weddings or parties and, and things like that. Um, probably the most famous story um, on those lines is that of the, the Hillswick wedding, which I will be telling in a later video in this series. So again, stay tuned for that one. A recurring theme in the stories of, of the fiddlers going to, to the Trerry weddings and parties is um, that they'd be away for much longer um, in, in human time than they thought. They thought generally they'd been away for and um, played a tune or two um, or maybe even a night but quite often these stories they'd be gone for um, a year and in at least one case up to a hundred years. Um, so uh, yeah I don't know if, if time moves more slowly in in kind of trial land or, um, or whether um, they, they just had a much better time than they thought they did. It's hard to tell. Uh, lots of these stories also um, involve the fiddler either uh, learning or remembering uh, tunes from the trows. And a lot of these trowy tunes have lasted through uh, in, into the modern day as part of the kind of the, the Shetland fiddle culture. Um, again, I'll discuss those um, a little bit later on in this, this video. Uh, the trows also had a couple of distinctive dance steps, um, one called the Henk and the other called the Lunk. Um, both of these are kind of like a weird sort of limping kind of step where they'd kind of drag their foot and Henk along or Lunk about. Um, but both of these um, both of these kind of dance steps are recorded in place names here in Shetland. Um, there's a uh, Henke's Canal in, uh, in Sandsting in the west side and uh, also there's a place called Lunk's Hool in Yale and both of these are places where the trows are said to have gathered for their dances. So I mentioned before um, trows are generally uh, mischievous, um, can kind of veer over into uh, malevolent, uh, malicious and, and even evil um, but that wasn't always the case. Um, there were some good trows I suppose for uh, for want of a, a better description 
Um, one example of this is a trow who was known in his area as Bruni. Um, Bruni kind of took it upon himself to look after um, the yards, kind of the, the, the fenced off or walled off areas around the crofts. Um, and, and he would kind of um, secure the, the stooks, the stacks of um, oats and corn and things like that, um, particularly if, if gales blew up. Um, he would kind of uh, secure them and make sure that the, the crops weren't blown away. Um, however, if anyone kind of interfered or tried to help him in any way, then he would take this as, uh, as an insult and would uh, kind of leave everything in, in disarray and not come back to that croft again. Um, at one time, he also took a whole neighbourhood uh, kind of into his care under his protection and um, he was often seen kind of moving about from croft to croft um, doing the various work in, in and around the yards. But uh, the women folk of this community kind of took pity on him being out there in, uh, in, in the cold and the wind and the rain um, in nothing but the kind of the, the threadbare patchy clothes that he had. So they thought they would um, kind of make him a, make him a gift uh, and of a, a hood and a cloak um, which they left for him in a yard that he, he was often seen in. Um, but again, this, this kind of well-meant, well-intentioned gift to him was taken as an offence and, uh, and he was never seen again. So that's us kind of had uh, an insight into uh, the trials and their activities, particularly in the past. But what of the present day? Uh, let's turn our attention now to have a look at how trials are kind of portrayed in modern culture. So I mentioned before uh, that a number of trowy fiddle tunes have been passed on to, to, to human fiddlers and kind of recorded and uh, passed on within the wider kind of Shetland tradition. Um, a lot of these tunes remain very popular to this day. All of the tunes that you've been hearing playing in the background of this video are of either trowy origin or at the very least of trowy inspiration. Um, and I will close up this video. Uh, I won't sing or play it myself because nobody needs to suffer that, but uh, the video will close with the most um, famous and, and popular of the Crowy songs. So um, that'll be in, in just a few short minutes. So generally speaking, the trows in kind of the modern day have been um, turned kind of cartoony, friendly, um, certainly not scary in any way. Um, again, as with a, a lot of tales from, from folklore um, all over the place, they've kind of been diluted and, and sanitized into nothing more than fairy tales really, um, which is a shame in a lot of ways. There's been a lot of uh, Bairns books published in, in the last few years, um, kind of centered on um, trowy characters. And again, they tend to be happy, friendly, helpful um, trials. They're not at all like the kind of the, the, the fearsome origins of, of these trowy stories. The good thing about them though is that they are um, making Shetland Bairns, the, the children here, um, aware at least of their, their history and their folk tradition and hopefully kind of as they, uh, they, they kind of grow up um, they'll hopefully kind of generate an interest in this and, and and kind of be more willing and more receptive to finding out about their own uh, their own folk history and, and kind of where these 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 stories that they're uh, that they're reading are are coming from what they're based on along similar lines to the children's storybooks there have been a few trows that have kind of cropped up in in various areas around the isles where where the trows are said to have frequented or where they do frequent maybe even um, but in places like the Lang um at Orbister in North Maven, and uh, also in, in Muckle Row, I've seen a few. Um, people have, have, have placed a, a few trows um, kind of by the roadsides or, or at places where, where people might, might spy them, might see them uh, as, as they're making their way through. Um, obviously, they are, they are just uh, gnomes and dwarves, but uh, I think they're really good fun and it's. Uh, yeah, it's a nice little nod to our to our traditions. 
Now, there are absolutely loads of traditional stories um, about the trous. Um, again, I've said already that I'll, I'll tell a few of these in a, a later video uh, in this series, which I'm personally lo really looking forward to. I hope you are too. Um, but in addition to kind of the, the traditional lore um, and, and these kind of these new uh, or more modern children's books that we're seeing, in 2007, the Shetland Folklore Development Group uh, published The Book of Trous, which is kind of a more academic take on, uh, on the subject and uh, kind of trying a, a place to kind of collate all of the kind of the, the known information uh, that we have about trous and trowy stories and, and those sorts of things. Um, I don't think it's in print anymore, it's quite hard to find, but uh, it's well worth a look if you, can, if you can source a copy. So yeah, I'm going to wrap up the video now um, with one of my favourite uh, favorite poems. It's in, in Shetland dialect, it's about the trous. Um, it's called Once Upon a Time and it's by the poet Vagaland. I'll post a transcription in the description below. Um, I'll also put a, a translation guide for, for some of the words down there um, because as I said it is, it is in Shetland dialect um, so some of it might be a little bit hard to understand but I'm sure you'll, you'll get the gist. So yeah, the poem goes like this. Ald many tells some fearsome stories she says the trows come out at night to wander around about the houses they day set till the morning light. She says they wait out by the brigsteads to tack bad bairns awa some place. The wash of them is peace their leety, terry mittens and crunch her face. My mammy says it's just a story, like what's it how the fairy tales? They're nothing waiting at the murkmen for peary bairns that's farked themselves. But when the night is getting darker, that dark that I can hardly see, I think if I'm being bad, then maybe the trows might come and look for me. And I'm anging when lamps is lighted for milk because we hae nae coo. Doon the rod and by the chapel and on along the burn brew and cross the dark brown frozen water, a step and stain to step and stain. It seems that far fae light at windows a pod along hill gate my lane. I'll never leet, I'll tack my pistol, the een that Santy brocht for me. My brand new sheenin automatic and a box of caps to lauder we. I'll lauder up and tack my blinky, then I can travel ony place, cause I'm no fair for peace their leety, terry mittens or truncher fates. So there we have it, that's Eens Upon a Time by Vagaland, who is my favourite Shetland poet. Um, I hope you enjoyed that and uh, I hope you've enjoyed the rest of this video too. I know I've, I've enjoyed kind of sharing this first delve into Shetland's history and culture and folklore with you. Um, and yeah, say so we'll be continuing this series over the next few weeks um, as we kind of build up in towards Halloween. So don't forget to like and share this video. I'd be very appreciative if you did so. And so that you don't miss any uh, more of the, the videos in the Spooky Shetland series and the other videos that we produce here on the Adventure Shetland YouTube channel, um, you can subscribe down there, um, ring the bell to turn your notifications on, and then you won't miss a single video that, uh, that we produce for you. So all of the social media links are down in the description as well as usual. Um, if you want to follow along with what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, then uh, all the links are there for you to be able to do that. Um, and also don't forget to let me know your thoughts on this video uh, down in the comments down there as well. As promised, we're going to close up the video now with the Trowy song by the legendary Shetland band Hombrew. Um, so we'll play that in just a moment. But uh, in the meantime, I'm John from Adventure Shetland. Thank you very much for joining me. And I will catch you again next time for some more spooky Shetland adventures. <laughs>
with the pretty ones and the shiny hands and glass of the days. And up to meet a neighbour man, he turned to thee and said, So we know our own trows today, we know our own trows. That the wildest past was hard to see, and they gloved thee with their blood reading and the worst thing of them ma. It's the pity heaven we just the one claw, glory and devotee clays and ah, we know our own trows. At the height of the night, they like the pity lights, they dance the trowy rail. The twist and the turn of the brew up in the barn And sing the songs as well And then they set the watch for the fox to catch You often chase the mother rods They giggled and they giggled when the seer got in touch And hoiled among the clods So the rain of our own honey throws the day The rain of our own honey throws That the wildest pastors just had to sing And they gloved thee with their blood reading And the worst thing of them ma it's the pity Aiden, just the wine claw, Claudia and Devotee, Clays and Ah, been a war on his throne. The sangs as well. Then they set the watch for the fox to catch. Glove and chest them all the rugs. The giggle and the gun when the seer got the turn and hoiled among the clouds. It's the rain of war, oh honey, throws the day. Rain of war, oh honey, throws. But the wildest bastards just had to see. And they gloved thee with the blood redding and the washing of the mud. It's the pity, heaven, just the wine claw. Glory and the poor, the clays and ah. Rain of war, oh honey, throws. So be the war, oh honey, throws the day. Be the war, oh honey, throws. But the wildest bastards had to see. And they gloved thee with the blood redding and the washing of the mud. It's the pity, heaven, we just the wine claw. Glory and the poor, the clays and ah. Be the war, oh honey, throws. Be the war, oh honey, throws.